if I ever do need an exorcist in real life, um, I want someone like uh, Father Amort. Um, he seemed quite heavy-lidded and slow-talking and, and very exact, but in fact his eyes were extraordinary. He never blinked and I found that really difficult to hold his gaze. Um, he's an interesting guy because for him exorcism isn't something out of the movies. It's a, an everyday act. It's an everyday act because he does it every day between five and twelve times every day of the year because he knows that the devil never sleeps. Enjoy every curve. Taxi! Excellent, mate. If you buy something on your Barclay card and find it cheaper elsewhere, we'll refund you the difference. Taxi! Just don't go too mad with it. Right. If we could just give us out of the bags, mate. We don't need another cab, do we? The only car in its class to have been awarded five stars in the independent Euro NCAB safety test. Renault Megane, Car of the Year 2003. This is just dreadful. We've now been waiting nearly 40 minutes for a suitcase and it's still raw. <laughs> They've wrecked a beautiful dish. A simple, simple, they wrecked it. I tell you what, I wouldn't serve that to my mother-in-law. Jamie's Kitchen continues Tuesday at 9 on 4. In the Middle Ages, the devil was the face of evil. But in the past couple of hundred years, as science has become the dominant belief system, that face has had to change. And it was here, in my home city of Edinburgh, that evil took on a new and chilling identity. Edinburgh has an extraordinary double nature. On the one hand, you've got the medieval city, a warren of alleys and tenements where Burke and Hare murdered their victims so they could sell the bodies for dissection. On the other hand, there's the Georgian Newtown, a place of order and planning, a place of reason, home of David Hume, Adam Smith and the, the great medical scientists of the Scottish Enlightenment. It was also the home of Robert Louis Stevenson. Edinburgh's dual nature inspired Stevenson to write his seminal work, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's a book that's had a huge effect on everything I've written. Stevenson's book is much more than just a tale of gothic imagining. He's saying that evil isn't something out there. It's inside all of us, and it only takes the right circumstances to bring it out. It's the birth of a new way of trying to understand evil in the scientific age. Basically a good man, you see. Only the evil in him could be isolated. But do you not see the tremendous release that could be achieved if the good and the evil could be separated? Hmm. How do you propose to achieve that, eh? Surely we can all recognize the difference between good and evil, eh? Stevenson thinking of the scientific development of Scotland. We must remember that the Scottish Enlightenment of the 18th century went on in medicine and was still there alive and well during the 19th century, and especially in the 1840s when Professor James Young Simpson, the professor of midwifery at Edinburgh University, developed the use of chloroform in order to ease the pangs of childbirth. Professor Simpson was experimenting with various substances, trying to find an effect of anaesthetic. When he tried inhaling the vapours of chloroform, whose properties were unknown at the time, he fell down, apparently dead, on the living room floor. When he came round again, he realised he'd quite enjoyed the experience. So they become quite used in the Simpson family to the business of somebody losing consciousness, so you separate body and mind. And suddenly you're, you've, you've got licence because you're not yourself anymore. Yes. And in fact, um, the Simpsons were very good, the Young Simpsons, uh, James Young Simpsons' son and daughter, were very good friends of Robert Louis Stevenson. He went sailing around Scotland with Young Simpson. 
So he uses that to develop the medical and scientific quality of Jekyll, who, like James Young Simpson, experiments on himself when he discovers the scientific properties of releasing good from evil or evil from good. Of course, the idea was that he should develop somebody who was truly good. But because of having the wrong thoughts in his mind at the point when he makes the experiment, it is a creature of pure evil that Dr. Jekyll produces. Now my conviction that man is not truly one, but truly two, is to be put to the test yet again. And therefore, for the first time, really, except in morality plays where vices are portrayed and so forth, you have the creature of pure evil emerging into modern consciousness, modern literature, and through film, and the whole modern culture. It seems to me that from Satan in Paradise Lost, the, the villain has always been quite seductive. Um, it happens a lot in Shakespeare. We don't get that in Hyde. Hyde isn't a seductive character. He doesn't make me want to be like him. No, because, and I think there's a very clear point that Stevenson wanted to get across there. Hyde does not seduce, he rapes. Uh, there is even the implication that the trampling of the little girl, the trample was a word which had a rape connection about it. And what do you do? What's your speciality? Pardon, sir? Well, what's your speciality? What do you do? Now, obviously, in putting out that story, he couldn't have Hyde raping a little girl, but we are to feel the violence of what he does in a rape sense. Truly, sir. You're a common harlot, aren't you? No, sir. There never is any chance but that he will be anything but pure evil once the experiment has actually happened. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde explores the notion that science can isolate pure evil. But at the same time as Stevenson was writing his fictional work, real scientists were trying to do the same sort of thing. Although they were trying to get away from medieval superstition, they still believed that evil had a face, and they looked for it in the places they feared most, the slums of the rapidly evolving cities. As urban working class populations grew, crime exploded and prisons filled up. One man believed that if he could find out what criminals have in common, he'd be able to tap into the essence of evil itself. And he did so by studying their faces. Francis Galton, a cousin of Charles Darwin's, persuaded prison governors to send him photographs of criminals He believed that by analysing these photos, he could isolate the face of evil. Galton was convinced that there was such a thing as a criminal type, and that it could be possible to identify physically the nature of the criminal. Now this assumption converged with the excitement and interest in photography, Victorian photography. Galton got busy with machinery, uh, invented a composite photography machine, where you, the idea was you could superimpose individual pictures of criminals, one on top of the other. You'd get rid of the extraneous individual features that didn't matter, and you could end up with the kind of pure image of a criminal, certain criminal type. I don't know, to me it seems almost medieval. It's, a, it's this idea that you can tell evil by looking it in the face. Mm. Um, it's almost like you can tell a witch by mm. looking for the, mm. the hidden signs um, on the body. Um, it, it, it seems an odd thing to come out of a scientific mm. age. I think the interest in for forensic photography uh, and composite photography that we see with Galton already is building on a, a earlier traditions in the 19th century, the belief that you can understand character through bumps in the skull. Phrenology. Phrenology, the belief that you can understand character through expression, through facial expression. Mm -hmm. Now, Galton's cousin Darwin was also extremely interested in this whole terrain, and soon after writing The Descent of Man in 1871, Darwin produced his own book, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals, which was also based on the study of numerous photographs his own, the, the facial expressions of his children, pictures of inmates from asylums. 
Charles Darwin's theory of evolution coincided with the rapid growth of the working class and created a new fear. If the degenerate urban underclass was breeding faster than its masters, might evolution go into reverse? Could humanity start evolving backwards towards a more primitive, a more evil state? If you read Darwin, it seemed that the most fertile were the most fit. Living in London in the later 19th century, looking at the fecundity of the working class, particularly the underclass, he thought there must be something wrong with, with Darwin's theory. Instead of the more optimistic idea about evolution and progress, you get a, a more shadowy and anxious language about species degenerating, arguing that you could understand many forms of mental illness and criminality, alcoholism, various other social pathologies could be understood through the umbrella term degeneracy, degeneration. Galton became increasingly convinced that the state ought to have a policy on biological reproduction, that you shouldn't leave it as a free-for-all of nature, but that you should actually have policies. And he coined the term eugenics in 1883. As early as that. As early as that, to, to describe what he hoped would become a new science of racial engineering. And this idea was picked up by many writers, creative writers, as well as philosophers, scientists, uh, and also then later criminologists. Galton's ideas spread right across Europe. In Turin, in Italy, you can still see the museum set up by the most enthusiastic of his followers, Cesare Lombroso. The death masks that Lombroso collected are marked with their owner's crimes. Murderer, forger, rapist. Lombroso believed that his method of identifying evil was so foolproof that society could dispense with any evidence of criminal acts and convict people purely because of the shape of their face. Cesare Lombroso coins this term atavist, from atavus, Latin for ancestor. The criminal is a throwback to the past. Looks as though he's living in present day times, but biologically is in the past. Now, Lombroso's theory powerfully challenges the idea of free will. Uh, the criminal isn't responsible, can't calculate. This has all sorts of implications for what should be done with the, mm -hmm. the criminal and uh, ideas about reform or rehabilitation, because Lombroso believes that at least some criminals are incapable of acting otherwise. And he certainly believes that you can identify certain facial features which will lead you to the criminal. 19th century thinkers believed that science could identify and isolate what it is that makes people evil. In the 20th century, new faces of evil were to emerge, and evil itself was to move much closer to home. Price reverse at b &Q. Now we bring you low prices on Christmas trees and lights. Just look at this artificial tree. Save £20. Now it's just £65. And now you can save £5 on 160 twinkling lights. They're only 19.98. Low prices stay low at B&Q this Christmas. Enjoy every curve. Real Christmas trees are arriving now at B&Q. This low needle drop Nordman fir is under £15. Even Christmas costs less at B&Q. When you're standing in one spot, an hour seems like forever. When you've been this high. It's hard to come down. David Blaine's Vertigo. If the devil was the early face of evil, 
and the scientific age saw evil as an atavistic throwback, a subspecies predestined to wickedness. One of the key images of evil for our age has been the serial killer, from Jack the Ripper to the Yorkshire Ripper to Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. We all have a mental image of this serial killer. I've used a few myself in my books. Sinister figures who haunt deserted streets and parking lots. But if this is a modern version of the face of evil, does it have any more basis in reality than the horned goat or the atavistic degenerate? The type of serial killer we hear all about is what you might call the, the Jack the Ripper, the Jeffrey Dahmer, the Ted Bundy character, the sex killer. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, killers who claim an awful lot of victims, those characters are very much a minority. The emphasis is all on the, the, the really obvious uh, Ripper sort of characters, not on the ones who are difficult to identify and difficult to pin down. And that's partly an emphasis of what the police can and cannot uh, do. But it also suggests that the, uh, the Ripper myth serves a purpose that is just that. It's a, it's a convenient social myth that serves a purpose in creating an easily understood demon figure. Do you think there was a change in the 70s and 80s about the perception of serial killing? If you look as far back as we have records, we can find cases in the 1890s, the 1920s, all the way through. And in each age, People always say, this is unprecedented, this is new, there's never been anything like this before. It's part of the rhetoric that people need to make, that we are going through uh, a dreadful age, things are falling apart. Um, in the 70s and 80s, uh, that meshed with the kind of moral concerns that people had about the time, um, particularly in terms of threats to women and threats to children. You have to understand any of those serial murder waves in terms of the people who are trying to um, understand the problem. Different people understand it at different times. When you have psychiatrists trying to understand it, they'll have a very Freudian approach. When you have feminist activists trying to dis uh, understand it, like you did in the 1970s and 80s, then they're going to emphasize the idea of the sex killer. So you have to understand, if you like, the consumers of the problem because they're as important as the problem itself. By the way, that uh, also affects another of the big errors that popular culture makes, because women serial killers, in fact, are very common. Um, if you take serial killers we know about, they make up about 25% of cases. But when you consider that women are likely to kill in means that are less likely to show up, and be detected, it's probably about 50-50. Serial murder probably is um, an equal opportunity kind of, uh, kind of offense. If our image of the thing we're most frightened of, the serial killer, is wrong, what's the real thing like? Underneath that tent, you've, you've made important discoveries. Did you say they did not include or could include uh, human remains? There's a possibility that it could include human remains. In 1979, Peter Jay was a detective who was called in after a diner rod man found human remains in a drain. Jay went to interview the occupant of the flat, a Scotsman called Dennis Nielsen. As soon as he opened the door, you, you could smell a sort of um, that, that uh, odour of, of decomposing flesh as soon as you got inside. Uh, and I said to him, your drains are blocked with human remains. And he said, oh my God, how awful. Uh, and I got a little closer to him and looked him straight in the eyes and said, don't mess me about, where's the rest of the body? And immediately he said, it's in plastic bags in the front room. And with that, we opened up the back room, uh, looked inside a couple of wardrobes, and there were several bags there um, supermarket bags containing uh, remains. And are we talking about one body here or, or two, perhaps? And Nielsen said neither. He said it's 16, and it actually turned out to be 15 later, but he lost count. I, I guess you asked him why he did it. Did you get any kind of explanation that made sense? Well, he actually asked us why we thought he did it. It just seemed that he was desperate to have a relationship I know at least on two occasions he had uh, victims um, 
he, he, he kept the victim sitting in chairs uh, at home um, and he used to come home from work and I think he thought to himself, well, albeit the guy is dead, there's somebody to come home to. Mm. It was bizarre. So what was Nelson like as a person? You wouldn't look at him, him straight away and even feel that there was something peculiar about him to begin with. In the context of what he'd done, he, he was just worryingly normal. He, he just seemed like Mr. Average because he is actually a complete and utter bore. So, however we glamorise it, the face of the serial killer is the face of a bore. But what about the other 20th century stereotype of the face of evil? The political leaders we hold responsible for massacres and genocide. Every few hours, another boatload of corpses is pulled up onto the beach at Demu. I find it hard to describe adequately the horrible things that I've seen and heard. It's hard to imagine, in our continent and in our time, what kind of people could do this. It wasn't Stalin or Hitler or Karadzic who massacred the people of Rwanda or Bosnia or who herded Jews into cattle trucks. It was ordinary people, bakers and postmen and shopkeepers. One American historian has made a detailed study of what ordinary men can do, of how they can change so that they become capable of the most terrible acts of evil. The men of Reserve Police Battalion 101 were ordinary Germans. They weren't political, they weren't Nazis. In the spring of 1942, most of them had never harmed a soul. The average age of the men was 39 and a half years old. They were in that age group that was too young to have fought in World War I, but old enough that they had had their formative experiences before 1933. So these are not people who had been raised in Nazi schools, in Hitler Youth. And uh, from terms of social background, uh, many of them, in fact, the bulk of them were unskilled uh, labor. So what exactly did the battalion do? Well, the battalion is sent from Germany to central Poland uh, in late June of 1942, uh, told that they were to round up all the Jews in this village, about 1800, send uh, the younger male Jews away as work Jews for the slave labor camps, and that they were then on the spot to shoot all the men, women, children, old people, infants, uh, to leave no one behind. Many of these people had never fired a or a human being in their life. They had not been in combat. These were middle-aged police far behind the lines. They arrive at the village uh, very early in the morning. No one has told the men yet what they're going to do, and so the major must finally explain it. Uh, they get out of their trucks at the edge of the village. Uh, the men say still just barely turning light. Uh, they're formed in a semicircle around the major, and he gives them a short speech. Uh, he tells them uh, that uh, he has, they have a task to do, a terrible task, a task he never would have asked them to do on his own. The witnesses say there were tears streaming down his cheeks, his body was shaking, he was fighting to control his voice, which was breaking. And then he went on to say what they were going to do. They were going to bring the Jews to the town center, uh, and then they would be put on trucks and taken to the woods uh, and executed. And at the very end of the speech, he says that any of you who do not feel up to it, please step out. And there's a long pause. And then he, somebody does step out. One of the young SS captains in the battalion begins to berate the man as a coward, and that how dare he? And the major cuts him off, takes the man under his protection, so the rest can see. And about a dozen men then step out. Out of 500 men, 12, 10 to 12, take up his offer not to shoot. They then round up the Jews in the village. Uh, that one company is sent to the woods to form the firing squad. Uh, the descriptions of, of the men of what took place in the forest are among the most horrific things I have read in, in now 30 years of doing research on the Holocaust.
thereafter, the job of the battalion is to either go to villages that are too far from the train stations, in which case they shoot everybody, or at the towns that are bigger and closer to trains, there they round up Jews, drive them to the train station, drive them onto the trains, pack the train cars as full as they can possibly get them, nail the doors shut, and ship them to Treblinka, which is about a 50 or 60 mile ride away. So these ordinary men, how did they justify these acts to themselves? You get a mixed bag. Uh, some uh, will say, well, I didn't want to appear weak in the eyes of my comrades. I didn't want to look like the weak link that couldn't hold. And they will talk about peer pressure. Others will say, you know, the spirit of the times, I didn't know better. And they're surprised and bewildered to be in the dock. Uh, to be accused and to be standing trial and be held accountable for this uh, because they don't feel guilty. Uh, they feel that they have suffered bad luck. They had the bad luck, uh, misfortune of being assigned to that battalion. That battalion had the misfortune to be assigned that task. Uh, and insofar as they feel pity, it is self-pity. It is not pity for the victims. The victims are almost off their screen. Uh, but there is a great deal of wallowing in self-pity that look what they had to suffer because they had to be assigned this duty and they had to carry this out. Do you think of um, the men who took part in these atrocities and during the, the Holocaust as being evil? And what we see, in fact, over a period of time is their transformation. Uh, that at the first massacre, uh, many of the men were quite traumatized, quite distraught by what they had been made to do or what they had been asked to do and had complied. Uh, over a period of time, there emerges within the battalion a real hard core of people who learn to enjoy killing, that volunteer for the task, that come home and joke about it over their meal, uh, that, that basically become totally corrupted by the experience uh, and the sense to become what they do. Not all of them do. I mean, there is human choice. We don't want to get the idea that this is simply deterministic. In fact, there is a group within the battalion that does not shoot, evades the shooting, uh, and that it shows that even under those circumstances, human responsibility remains, human choice remains, uh, but that we can predict that given certain circumstances, uh, governments will find enough people to carry out government legitimized crime even if everyone does not. Uh, and it is the carrying out of that that, in a sense, makes these people evil. Even in little things where you say, well, at this point in time, I could go and visit somebody in hospital, but it's raining, and uh, I could watch television, and uh, anyway, they probably don't want to see me all that much. Uh, and you think of all sorts of reasons, but that's a choice of evil. And it might be a little thing, and you're not actually torturing anybody, but you're just choosing something which is less compassionate. I think that is evil. For most of us, evil doesn't seem very great because we don't have much power. But if you put us into government, or into positions of power, that can lead to catastrophic consequences. The history of seeing the face of evil is the history of trying to avoid responsibility. It used to be the devil or the atavistic degenerate. Today, it's more likely to be the face on the front of a newspaper, a serial killer or terrorist. But I'm left with Peter Jay's description of Dennis Nilsson as worryingly normal. That's what's so frightening about the search for the face of evil. It's the face of the man in the next street, the woman next door, when they make the wrong choice, the selfish choice. It's your face or mine. Coming up on Four Men at the sharp end of World War II bomb disposal recall life-threatening moments and the battle of wits between them and the Germans, who develop more and more ingenious devices. Danger, an exploded bomb, is next. This year, 30 people gave up their jobs and homes to spend 12 months on a new reality TV show. You've only got one life, you've got to live it to the full. I'll tell you what, this is wicked! Woo! Yeah! yeah! Okay, 
preparing yourself for a year away from your family is quite difficult. I just thought it would be fun to be on reality TV. The prize, £100,000 and the chance of fame. We also want to be on TV, don't we? Yes! Yeah. Oh it's amazing. This was an opportunity for me to develop my career in a very exciting way. But the challenge was going to be tough. I can't believe it! I still think we're in trouble. This is not what any of us were expecting. The only other problem is... I think this is the moment to stop. The shows are fake and only exists in this man's mind. I want to actually speak to him and find out what the hell is going on. The Great Reality TV Swindle, Tuesday at 10.35 on 4. Film 4's Ray Winston Night continues with the shocking and compelling Borstal drama Scum at 11.35. To subscribe, just call free on 0800 1234 or log on to the website. A blend of instruments. A blend of the finest single malts. Bells. It's all in the blend. Look what I've been doing.